Good evening. It is December 16th of 2020, and it's time for our midweek Bible study. Let us notice, boy, it is the 16th, which means a week from tomorrow is Christmas Eve. Here at Travis Baptist Church, we annually have a Christmas Eve service beginning at 6 p.m. This year is no different. If you would like to come and spend Christmas Eve with us from about 6 to probably no later than 7 o'clock. Usually we're done by 6.45. It's a candlelight service. At a certain point in time, we turn the lights off and we pass the flame across the room as we meditate on that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light and a son has been given to them in celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus. So um, keep that in mind if you would like to join us. 6 p.m. Uh, next Thursday, Christmas Eve. And uh, we are located at the corner of Weber and Holly, kind of, right across from the HEB on Weber Road here in Corpus Christi, Texas, in front of the Bank of America and the, the, the uh, Schlotzkys, that's what it's called. Um, and so please keep that in mind for Christmas Eve. This Sunday, December 20th, um, is also a big day for us. We are going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper, and uh, you are welcome to come and uh, join us for that. Um, it would also be our last Sunday of Advent, the fourth Sunday of Advent, where we celebrate joy, the joy that Christ has come into the world. So uh, if you want to sing some Christmas songs, we got two opportunities this week. It'll be on the 20th at 10.45 a.m. Sunday, December 20th, 10.45 a.m., Thursday, December 24th, 6 p.m. You, uh, uh, Everybody's welcome. So um, please think about that. We also on Sunday have Sunday school at 9.30. So uh, that's an option also. And tomorrow night will be our, the 18th will be our, or the 17th rather, will be the last Awana for this semester. Our last kids approved workmen are not ashamed uh, discipleship program. That will be again tomorrow night, 6.20. And then we will have a hiatus until after New Year, about the time school starts back up in January is when that will continue. Uh, so come and join us for all that. A couple more announcements. We've had some losses here in the church lately. Um, Lori Townsend, uh, her father Charles passed away and the, there was visitation tonight, the 16th, at um, Sawyer Funeral Home from uh, starting at 6 p.m. And then the service is uh, Thursday, tomorrow at 11.30 out there at Sawyer. And um, so please uh, be in prayer for them. Um, we also just got word this morning that uh, Patricia and Gary Culp uh, lost their adult daughter, Colleen. She, Colleen lives out in Arizona. And um, uh, basically, I just told you everything we know about that. We don't have any more details yet. Just keep Gary and Patricia in your prayers. Keep Crystal in your prayers, losing her sister. And, uh, of course, Skylar losing her aunt. So be in prayer for all these. Um, and ask God to, to be with them in a special way. It's always tough to lose people. And then it gets even tougher when it's right around Christmas. So keep those things in mind, please. Let's pray together. All right. Our Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you. And, and we don't understand everything, Lord, but we know that we die. It's appointed to us once to die. And so we pray, Lord, for the families that have lost loved ones. We pray for Lori and Emma Ruth and, and Lori's brother in the loss of their father. And we pray, God, that you will give them comfort during this time, that your peace would dwell with them. And we pray also for... Um, Colleen's family, for Gary and Patricia and Crystal and Skylar and all the bunch, Lord, and we just pray that your peace and your comfort are with them, that they know that they are loved by you, that they know that everything that's in your hands is done for a good reason. It's tough, Lord, because living in this sin-contaminated world, death is a part of it. Help us, please. To cope with this and to understand you better and to know you better. We love you and we thank you for being there at times like this. And we ask all these things in the name of your son Christ. Amen. All right. Um, we are in Luke chapter 16. We started last week a new series entitled The, en the Last Enemy. Um, the last enemy according to the Bible is death. And... Uh, 
Michael Whitmer, uh, he, he wrote a book entitled The Last Enemy and just really influenced me a lot and got me to thinking and and other things that we've gone as we wind down 2020, man, has death been hanging over our heads in a lot of ways. Are we ready for the catastrophes that we'll be following? Are we ready for the struggles that are ahead that never seem to end? And so um, we began last week, you know, just talking about the inevitability of death. Um, it's something in the back of our minds we all know, but then we get confronted with it once in a while. This week we've had two deaths in the church family. Um, we have another sister, Naomi, who has been diagnosed um, with cancer. They don't know how bad or to what extent yet. It's just the original needle biopsy showed that. So we want to pray for her. But, you know, these things suddenly wake us up to our mortality. It is inevitable, but it also is fearful to us. And what we're going to talk about today a little bit is the, the bad part. Um, I think one of the big reasons, well, there's several reasons I think death holds fear and anxiety for us is, quite frankly, nobody who's gone all the way across has come back and told us everything that happened. Um, I know we got those books out there of people who died for half an hour or something. Um, we even have a member of our church who, who died for a few minutes during a surgery and came back and he says, you know, he's not afraid because the glimpse he got of what's out over there. Um, that is a wonderful thing. Um, we, you know, I'm one of those that just really wish there was one more book in the Bible and that had been written by that guy Lazarus. You know, you remember Lazarus, you know, he was dead for four days. And when Jesus finally got there and Jesus called him right out of that grave and Lazarus came on out. Um, we assume Lazarus lived to a, a while longer and then died again. Um, wouldn't it be neat, though, to kind of get a Lazarus's book on, on, on what he saw? Like I said, many of the, the afterlife glimpses we've had are people who just for a few moments, just for a few minutes. But, you know, Lazarus is over there four days. What did he see? What did he know? What did he remember? Um, would be fascinating. But God, in his wisdom keeps death a bit of a mystery to us. Um, yes, there are glimpses. There is the book of Revelation. There are other passages that speak of heaven and how wonderful it will be. And that fills us with joy. But it's, but it's kind of like watching a highlight reel or a trailer for the next blockbuster movie. Um, you ever be at the theater and you see the trailer and you go, man, that looks like it's going to be so great because you get a glimpse of this and a glimpse of that. It's going to be hilarious. It's going to be great. And, and you, when you get to the actual movie, sometimes, yeah, it's just as good as the trailer. And other times you get there and, man, the trailer had all the good parts in it. I can't remember the name, but I remember watching the, the highlights, the upcoming event once and thought that movie was going to be just hilarious and shelled out the money for it. And yeah, all the good jokes were in the trailer. I mean, after that, they, 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 the three good jokes, yeah, they were in the trailer. There was nothing good after that. I mean, it was dull, boring. We know God is not like that. But what I'm trying to say is our glimpses of the afterlife are partial. They help. But boy, there sure still are a lot of questions, aren't there? What it's really like. Of course, the biggest question is, does it hurt um, to, to, to go across that line, to pass from life into death and the new life that we have awaiting for us? Today, you know, that, that gives rise to all that anxiety and all that fear, just the not knowing. But there's another aspect, too, and that's the aspect of judgment. Because as the Bible clearly teaches, you know, it's appointed to man once to die. We're all going to die. And after that, the judgment. Um, yeah, that kind of gets us nervous, especially when we think about the bad part of that judgment. And that's kind of what we're going to start with today. Um, we're going to talk about hell. If you wish for a more detailed account of what I'm doing today, you can probably go back to either the church website, the church Facebook page, October 18th of this year. Um, we were going through Second Thessalonians and preached a whole Sunday morning sermon on hell. And um, and what we're going to say about it is not meant to disturb anyone, but if we're going to look at the Bible and go by what it teaches, well, yeah, we got to deal with it. And I think a lot of our fear and our trepidation is 
about that aspect of it? What if afterlife isn't streets of gold? Or what if it isn't streets of gold for me? Um, so let's take a look here. We're going to be in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16 is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We're going to read verses 22 through 24. This story actually starts, um, let me see, quite a bit earlier than that. Um, like about verse 19. But we're going to read verses 22 through 24. In Luke 16, verses 19 through 31 is the story of what we call the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who had a beggar sitting outside the wall of his estate. And the rich man had more than enough, and he never even gave the beggar a moment's notice. They both die. Um, they wake up in different places. Um, the, Laz the, the, the Lazarus, the beggar, wakes up, it says, in Abraham's bosom. Which for a Jew, somebody raised in the Old Testament culture, oh my, that is heaven. That is being next to the Godfather of us all, um, Father Abraham. And he is in perfect peace, perfect happiness. The rich man, as we shall see, wakes up in a different place. Let's look at Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 22. So it was that the beggar died... And was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Look what happens next, verse 23. And being in torments in hell, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. The passage goes on and Father Abraham tells the rich man, dude, not going to do it. Uh, there is a big gulf between us and we can't reach across. We can't cross from heaven to hell, basically. Um, and so the rich man then says, well, well, why don't you send Lazarus back and let him go tell my family so that they can avoid this place? And the rich man is told, you know what? If they didn't believe Moses and the prophets, which equals the Old Testament, the Bible, if they didn't believe that, they're not going to believe even if someone rose him from the grave. And so what we have here is the picture of two people. And when they died, they went to different places. Some say this is just a parable, like Jesus told so many parables, a symbolic story to teach a point in truth. If it is a parable, a symbolic story to teach a point in truth, well, that point in truth is that, man, you're going to one of two places when you die. Others feel that since we use the name Lazarus, and we never in a parable see a guy's name being used, that it's not a parable, it's just an actual account. Jesus has given us a glimpse into the afterlife and what it's going to be like. Wherever you land, it can't be denied this is what Jesus is teaching. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And for us to make anything out else out of that is not being honest with what the clear teaching of the scripture is. You may not like it, but if you're going to say, I'm a believer, you don't get to pick and choose. If I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, that means I am coming to the word of God with the open heart that whatever it says clearly teaching, I follow. So here we've got a guy in heaven, a guy in hell. And what do I make of that? Well, I need to understand this is, again, a very clear teaching. For instance, um, I think we can see easily here Jesus teaching at least four things about hell um, in this passage. Number one, maybe it's five things actually. Number one, it's real. Because this rich man, when he woke up, he was in torments. He died, it says in verse 22, and was buried. And in verse 23, very next verse, and being in torments, he lifted up his eyes. So 
it's a real place. He's conscious. He's observing. He's feeling. He knows where he is. Um, I don't think Jesus is doing anything symbolic here. I think he's trying to point out, if you don't follow me, it's going to be pure and utter misery. Which brings us to our second point. Not only is it real, it's miserable. Being in torments, he lifted up his eyes. You know, we often picture hell as being fire. Well, look at the picture here. He cries out in verse 24, Have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Yeah, I know who that guy is. He used to sit outside my house every day. And Would you just ask him, and look at the picture, to dip the tip of his finger in some water and put that eh, on the tip of my tongue that I might have relief. We've all been hot and thirsty enough that, we, man, just a drink of water would do me so much good. Can you imagine a drop or two off of someone else's finger on the very tip? I mean, you know, I remember last time I replaced a, my, my back fence. You know, I was digging the post holes, and it's that hard clay junk we have around here in Nueces County, and that stuff's nearly as hard as a rock when it's hot. And anyway, I was using both a power auger and my post hole diggers because I needed them both, and it was probably taking 30 to 40 minutes for the nine hole, each of the nine holes I had to, to dig that day. And uh, man, I went through probably a case of water. And each time when I grabbed that, well, oh man, that is helping so much. I need it so bad. I cannot imagine being so hot where I would feel the same with just a drop. Because I needed more than a drop. But the torment is real here. Just a drop. And he can't have it. Why can't he have it? Because there is a banishment with hell. He says here um, in verse 26, you know, um, between us and you, this is Abraham talking to the rich man, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. In other words, there's a big chasm, there's a gulf, there's an uncrossable space. We can't get to you, you can't get to us. Sorry, you don't get the drip of water on your tongue. When Adam and Eve failed in the Garden of Eden, what did God do? He kicked them out. Part of the punishment in hell is not just the heat, torment. It is also the aspect of banishment and separation. Because Adam and Eve disobeyed Him, God kicked them out of the Garden. When Jesus was on the cross... The Bible clearly teaches that He who knew no sin, because Jesus never committed a sin... But God made him to be sin for us. All our guilt, all our sin laid on his shoulders while he hung on that cross. He became the guiltiest sinner ever in those moments. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing this banishment, this separation from his father. Here's the deal. Jesus, the eternal son of God, God the son if you will, from eternity past, He was there at creation participating. He was not coming into existence on Christmas Day. He took on human flesh on Christmas Day. Okay, But as God, He had never been separated from the Father. He was in perfect communion with Him when He was here on earth. And then He comes to the cross. And the guilt of the world is laid upon Him. He becomes sin for us. And suddenly He is faced with the holy terror that most of us think isn't that big a deal, but one day we will realize what this means. This banishment, this separation, this getting kicked out of the garden, the gulf that can't be crossed. And Jesus goes, God, you're not there anymore. Father, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? That's part of what hell is. The hopelessness of knowing that you're crying out and nobody's listening. I hope that sends a chill up your spine when you think about it. Because, man, you know, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care. I can always go to Him with all my burdens. I can always cast my cares upon Him. But, boy, in that moment, Jesus, I think, experienced all the punishment a sinner could receive. And I think part of His suffering, not just the pain of the nails and the thorns, but the abandonment by His Father. The turning of the back. Now, 
Three days later, Jesus comes out of that grave, and there is open arms for Jesus. But it's teaching us a bit of what hell is like in that cry. For you and I to realize, Jesus is telling us here, there's a separation, there's a banishment. One of the great promises of the Bible is God says, I will never leave nor forsake you. And yet here He's saying, unless you forsake me, unless you turn away from me, if you never believe, yeah, you've got an eternity separated, banished. And it's everlasting. Um, at no point in time is Lazarus told, or the rich man told, rather, that he gets to leave. He's there, he's stuck, and he knows it. Um, you know, he cries out and says in verse 27, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I got five brothers that he might tell them, lest they show up here. It's misery, and, and I, don't, I don't want them to come here, and there's no escape. He doesn't ask that he can go. He asks, can, send Lazarus. I know I'm condemned here forever. Um, Jesus, in several other places, mentions the eternity of hell in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's a forever thing. But, but here's the big thing. Um, the fifth thing teaches Jesus, Jesus teaches us about hell. Number one, it's real. Number two, it's miserable. Number three, it's eternal banishment. Number four, it's everlasting. Number five, it's avoidable. Really? Yeah. And it's not avoidable by your good things outweighing your bad things. It's avoidable because of what Jesus did on that cross. When he did cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he said, It is finished. And he died. With those three phrases, he's saying, I'm experiencing hell. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. I'm experiencing death. And then he says, it is finished. The sacrifice that I came to pay to cleanse all of us of our sins, I did it. So with those three last three phrases on the cross, Jesus is giving you and I complete comfort and assurance that we can avoid that hell. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, that where I am, there you may be also. In all these things, he always follows up with something like, I am the way, the truth, and life. Whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The fear of hell and afterlife is lifted with a trust in Jesus Christ. A growing faith in him. Daily Bible reading, prayer, worshiping with God's people. Seeking to grow every day. Death is a scary thing. We grieve. Not with hopelessness, but we grieve for the loss of a loved one. But we also know there is a great reunion day. We also know that we have a home reserved. Our name is written down in God's book. We who have come to Jesus. And so as we look at how bad hell is, we turn around and say, remember, it's avoidable. Sure, it's real. It's miserable. It's eternal. It's banishment. But it's avoidable. And the very one who we often say, if he was a loving God, he wouldn't send us to hell. He's the one who made the way out. Because quite frankly, on our own and without him, look at the evil in the world. Not just the violence, but the, the sexual assaults, the lies, the deception, the corruption. You know, just this week, um, that terrorist group in Nigeria has taken another 300 students hostage. You know, a couple of years ago, it was all females. This time, it's all males. Um, they're a Muslim extremist group. And, and why does that happen? Because sin so easily pervade our society. Um, look at your local newspaper. Listen to what's going on around you. The murders, the violence, the harm of being done to innocent people, the trafficking of other human beings. All of this constantly going around us. We weren't created for that. And Jesus died to help us escape from it. A verse that's been on my heart in Hebrews chapter 2. 
has been how, uh, I think it's around verse 17, where it talks about how Jesus became human like us. That he might taste death once for all of us and defeat it. To save all of us who all our lives have lived in fear of the bondage of death. Here's the deal. Jesus died so you and I wouldn't have to have this fear and trepidation about judgment and death. I have the assurance of God's promises, God's word, the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus himself. That it's not condemnation that waits for me. And it's not because I'm a pastor, it's because I'm one of God's children. The Word of God tells us, John chapter 12, John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as receive Him, as many of them say to Jesus, Lord, please come into my life. I don't want to go the way it's going. Come in and turn me around, Lord. As many as receive Him, He gives the power to become a child of God. You today have that opportunity. So if death is hanging over you and this thing about hell disturbs you, now if you just want to mock and say, I ain't no such thing as hell, all right. Don't agree with Jesus there, okay? Um, because this is coming from his mouth, his words. It's not some interpretation I made up. Basically, I just gave you a summary of the story. Uh, you can read it for yourself there in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. But you've got to decide. And as we get older, we lose people we love, but we also know it is so good to know we haven't lost them forever. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And help us to hang on to this truth. And thank you, Lord, for freeing us from the fear of death. You have destroyed death. You have destroyed the power of sin. Our chains are broken. Our fears are destroyed. Because you, Lord Jesus, are risen from the dead. With your resurrection, all these promises are true. As incredible as it is, though crucified on the cross, death could not hold you. And now you sit at the right hand of the Father, and one day soon you're bringing us home. We long to see you, Lord. Until then, give us strength, give us wisdom, give us power to do the things you've called us to do. To be the people you've called us to be. Lord, help that one today who's just filled with anxiety and fear. That maybe this message upset them more, but let them know that there's a solution here. And it's not to dismiss the idea of hell. The solution is to reach out to you. To say to you, help me Lord, save me from that. God, we pray this for every person listening in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. And do we want to remind you again, this Sunday the 20th, we have Sunday school at 9.30. Uh, worship at 1045. We are celebrating the Lord's Supper. And um, then on Thursday the 24th, we have Christmas Eve beginning at 6 p.m. So grateful to have you come and join us. Um, check us out on the internet. We've got a, our Facebook page. Just search for Travis Baptist Church Corpus Christi, Texas on Facebook. Um, there is usually a link for all the messages on there. And then also we have our website, www.travisbaptist.org. If you go to the sermons button, the downloads and sermons, um, you've got MP3 audio versions of this message and so many Sunday and Wednesday messages. And uh, uh, at, on both the website, when you click on a message, and also on the Facebook page, there will be a link to our YouTube page so you can um, watch the video. And uh, we do put Sunday morning service and this Wednesday Bible study. So... Come and join us if you are not able to get out of your house yet or not feeling com comfortable with that. Join us on the internet. And if not, then if you're feeling comfortable, then come see us. All right. We would love to have you with us. May God bless you. And we hope to see you soon.